this issue of Newsweek, the cover shows a dog and it says, does your dog love you? And a scientist actually did the research. Scientifically, they wanted to find out chemically, MRI-wise, if they really love you. But why don't you tell, I know you have a story about a dog you were... Well, you know, you're talking about a dog and the fact... So I, I did a movie years ago that Richard Gere uh, started and produced uh, called Hachi. And it is based on a true story that happened in Japan with a dog named Hachiko, where Hachiko's owner uh, would walk with Hachiko, or Hachi for now, um, to, to the train station every day so that he would go off to work and the dog would make its way home, and then the dog must have learned what time the train back from work would come, and he would walk back to the station to greet his owner every day. Well, after years of doing this, apparently, the owner went to the train in the morning, Hachiko walked with him, went back home, but the guy died while he was at work. Oof. So Hachiko went back to the train station, the owner never gets off the train, and the story is that Hachiko never left the train station. He waited literally for the rest of his life for his owner to come off the train. And in Japan, this story is told and uh, with reverence, and there's a, a statue of Hachiko because he's become a symbol of true love and loyalty. So we did the American version of that story. Uh, I got to work with Lila, by the way. <laughs> one of the Hachis. My, yeah, one of, one of the dogs that played Hachi. Um, my first day in the trailer, the, the makeup gals looked at the call sheet and went, oh, you're working, you're with, working with Lila. Wow. And I said, is, is Lila good? And they, with a straight face, they said, she's the Meryl Streep of dogs. And you know what? She was very good. <laughs> she, she actually gave was. She, she, gave was very, she gave. She gave something. Um, but I always was wondering, uh, you know, not to, not to, uh, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah, but I go, say it. yeah, he's living, the dog is living at the train station because everyone that knew the dog and the guy on day one is going, oh, he doesn't know. So it's pets and cuddles and a treat and a thing. And every and now the dog's there tomorrow. So by Excuse within me. three days, the whole train station is feeding this dog, watering this dog, petting this dog, giving it toys to play. I mean, what, why would it go home? Why? It, by the it, way, it's it, funny. I have some insight into dogs. I understand that Haji was waiting for the movie to break even. <laughs> waiting, waiting well, for the then he's still waiting. So I, when we had our, our series out, Bob Patterson, I went to Universal one weekend to do the editing. And they were filming all kinds of stuff. War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise. Great. Walking around the studio. And they were doing a thing, if you're of age, of Lassie, which is a, um, a collie. Beautiful dog. Yeah. And similar to that, I walk and I see Lassie. And it is the most beautiful dog I've ever seen. I mean, brushed out. The, the Yeah. The collar and the hair and the thing, and I go, this is Lassie, and they go, bring Lassie to the set. We got, we're ready for her. And I go, not this one. They go, no, we got the stunt Lassie. The stunt Lassie, yeah, pieces out. The eye is going like this. <laughs> the eye, they're going to throw that one. They're going to throw that one. At the, the dog is limping. It's got all kinds of stuff. And this Lassie's getting treats and watching while they bring out the other Lassie. Right. They, all right, throw him in front of the train. We'll get Ryan Reynolds to play him, that throw Lassie him in front of the train. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, dogs are <clears> fascinating <throat> to me, and and this. Your question of how can you tell if a dog is truly in love with you? Right. Let's get, let's get Dr. Burns. With Let me come. introduce this yeah. fine gentleman to you all. Uh, Dr. Gregory Burns is a, the distinguished professor, <clears throat> not just you know distinguished, the associate, the underling, distinguished professor of neuroeconomics at Emory University. He directs the Center for Neuro Policy. He's a New York Times bestselling author of How Dogs Love Us. Well, let's say hi to Dr. Burns. Dr. Also, Burns. If you're watching this on YouTube, has the coolest den of anybody we've ever been interviewed. <laughs> and a great, is that an ES-335 behind you? G Gibson or Epiphone? Well, there's two. There's a Strat and then there's a Gibson. Oh, and there's a dog, your newer dog. Is that the newer, the newer dog? Oh. No, Me? that's Callie. She's the original. Wow. Wow. Well, well, didn't the original get arthritis and die, which, which is what made you do this, correct? No, that was Newton, the original Pug. the inspiration for right. the whole project. But she was she took his place and she was the first MRI dog. The dog got up to say hello. You didn't actually we always do this. We seg right in without saying hello, welcome to the show. It's lovely to meet you. Wait a minute, move. Thanks there's for another spending animal. time with there's us. another animal. There's another there's two, animal. There's two? No. There's, two. there's one. That's no, there's two. Oh, there's two. 
Gorgeous, gorgeous. What the? Oh, I, oh, that's a head. I actually thought I was seeing the head and arms of a primate on the floor for a second. <laughs> He's got a it's the head of, and ears. Of <laughs> and so, Dr. Burns, can you run us through the background of that, of what stimulated this entire study, the article, the MRIs, et cetera? It's fascinating. The fact of it is, is that for most of my career, I used to study humans and put people in MRI scanners to see how people think and how they make decisions and and that's what the field of neuroeconomics is about. And, and yes, I still carry that title just um, because I have nothing better to describe myself <laughs> with. Um, and and what happened was this was back in 2011. And if you think way back what was happening in 2011, what happened was that there was this mission to go after bin Laden, remember? Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, that's kind of its own thing thing but me being a dog person what captured my interest was the fact that there was a dog on that mission and and there was a lot of press about it and i saw all these pictures of of dogs in the military and i didn't know anything about military dogs but i saw these pictures of dogs being trained to jump out of helicopters and i thought you know me being an mri guy and if and if, if you've had an mri and i'm, and I'm guessing because we're all of a certain age everyone here has had an mri uh you know what they sound like. Yeah. Um, they're pretty unpleasant. They're pretty loud. And so I thought, wow, you know, if a dog can jump out of a helicopter, then why don't we train dogs to go an MRI scanner so we can see what they're thinking? And that really was the beginning of it. And as as I sometimes tell people, it was also a good excuse to take my dog to work every day. Uh, yeah. What did your studies yield that blew your mind as far as the dogs truly loving us and having feelings and emotions? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you have to realize when we started the project, really, you know, the the dog brain was was just kind of a it's an unwritten map. I mean, nobody had really looked at how it's organized. You know, we know a lot about the human brain, we know a lot about uh, other primates because they're similar to us, but uh, and we know about you know smaller animals like mice and rats, but but honestly, uh, it was just kind of initially just going out exploring. And so we started with the easiest, simplest, dumb experiments we could think of. I mean, one, we had to prove that we could train dogs to hold still long enough to even get good images that we could analyze. And so once we did that, then we just kind of uh, proceeded systematically first with their reward system. And, and when we talk about reward systems in brains, it turns out that, you know, for mammals, we're all pretty similar because you can look at a brain and say, oh, okay, that's that part of the brain. This is the reward center. We know where, where it's located. We know that that's where dopamine exerts most of its actions. And so then what we, we, we could set out to do then is see in the dog, okay, well, what, what activates it the most? So we know in people kind of how it works. We know what motivates people, uh, kind of the basic primary rewards, things like food and water porn, uh, money, uh, so, and yeah, you know, all these things have been done in, in you scanners to people. What's so funny? I mean, just, you know, I just wondered, you know, how do you present that to your colleagues the first time? You know what? I think we should try because you know what? We've done food and water. <laughs> Next thing comes to my mind. <laughs> he slid it in, didn't he? he yeah. Right. Got right by And by the way, yeah. not wrong. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I never, I didn't I'll say, you, no I didn't, you didn't hear me ring a buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> I just noted it. That's when you die right now, we said the number one thing dogs love, porn. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, all right, so you know what rings our bell, JQ? So what is it, what is in dogs you were able to kind of isolate that was interesting to you? Well, so we start with kind of the obvious things. So initially we start with food. And in fact, that's how we train the dogs in the first place to go in the scanner reward them with food. Although I, I tell you, early on, we noted that a lot of the dogs that we started training didn't really seem to care as much about the food as the actual just interaction with, with their person and just kind of the praise and, and just the whole activity itself. And that's, that's how we did all the training. We just turned it into a big game for the dogs. So after we showed that we could kind of hold up a treat and then we could see the reward center of the, the dogs light up, then we started doing kind of more subtle things. Then we just did things like, okay, we'll just praise the dog, you know, say, good girl, good boy. And what does that do? Well, it turns out it does the same thing. 
So here we have these dogs um, who most people kind of assume just did what they did because at the end of the day, yeah, we feed them, we house them, and you know we take care of them. And and you know a lot of scientists for many years kind of thought that the the biggest trick that dogs did in becoming dogs was getting us to take care of them. That was their evolutionary breakthrough, right? right. Um, but it turns out it's it's a it's a bit more interesting and and more complex than that because you know we found that for most of the dogs that this kind of when you offer food and praise they're they're pretty much equally activating to the dog's reward center wow. and in, in some dogs in fact the praise was even more activating and so how do you explain that and the simplest answer is you know they just have social rewards just very much like people do you know everyone likes praise you know everyone likes to be told they're doing a good job and you know dogs are the same there, it's what's amazing is when you think about it how they've managed to interact with the different species. They don't knock stuff over in your house. You can train one to be a seeing eye dog, which is stunning. The the chores and tasks that they have to do and want to do uh, that others don't do. The one that got me the thing is pointing. That even chimpanzees don't do this. That when you point to a dog to give it a cue where it is, the dog figures out what you're doing. What you're pointing at. Yeah. Whereas chimps don't necessarily do that, correct? That's what they say. Although, you know, I, I think... Many animals can be taught to do this. I think a lot of what dogs do is because they live around us so much. You know, you don't you don't live with chimps. You know, chimps, you know, chimps will tear your face off and other parts as well. So dogs have this opportunity to to really learn from immersion from, you know, human society. But I want to go back a step. So you you know, you were talking about the 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 um dopamine center of the dog its brain responded um, equally or, or even preferably to to praise as it did to food. But does that, and I guess this is the essential question that we're asking in this episode, does that equate to a true, um, lack of a better word, love for the person giving it to them? Like if I'm working for a, a director that I admire and he goes, oh, that was a great take. That was such a great scene. What a great job. I'm sure I'm getting the dopamine hit, but it doesn't mean I love this person. <laughs> you know. It, so how do we, or do we know at this point that you can actually take that reaction and equate it to what we think of as love? Yeah, I get, I get this a lot. And it reminds me, I once did, I once did, did a morning show uh, uh, when all these results came out and the host was very well-meaning uh, and I kind of knew what she was expecting me to say uh, because she said to me at one point, she says, well, gee, Dr. Burns, so does my dog really love me? <laughs> and I kind of stupidly just uh, answered what I was thinking at the moment. And I said, gee, I don't know you and I don't know your dog. How should I know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. I love that. See, now I love you. I can actually right. say I love you for that. For that. Well, so, now you know me, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, it's it's this this is a hard question, and uh, you were alluding to it in the introduction. It's like, how do you know anybody loves you? Is it because of what they say? Maybe, but you know, I mean, people people are good at you know acting. Yeah, yeah, you know? sure. Now. I would say that dogs are not actors. I don't think so. Right. Except, I mean, you don't think, you don't think they have guile. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in many ways, I think it's easier for us as humans to read their actions and interpret them at face value. So, and and I don't think you need an MRI for this. You know, most, most dog owners and, and dog lovers, you know, will tell me, it's like, well, gee, you just proved what, what I've known all along. And the best way I can I can kind of conceptualize this in terms of love, and because I've been asked, like, well, what's your definition of love? So we have to acknowledge that that word does not really capture all the nuances of it. I mean, right. we, we apply it in so many different ways and in so many different types of love, you know, whether it's romantic love, uh, parental love, brotherly love, friendship. The word applies to all of the circumstances. And so my view is that if we take kind of a dog version of it, 
uh, however we define it, then I think it's easy to recognize. And it is easy to recognize if you say love is non-transactional, meaning it's not dependent on something else. It's not dependent on the fact that I feed the dogs or do anything else. It's just that they want to be with me or whoever. Right. And if they come up and they just want to be around you, hey, I'll take that as love. So that, for me, that begs two questions. And, one, and I'll use my, my, my departed dog, Sandy, as a, an example. So when I would uh, see Sandy at the end of a day, if I come home from work, she would do what I would expect a dog that is crazy about me to do. She'd get very excited. She she couldn't get on me enough. You know, she's rubbing her whole body. The tail is going. The licks are happening. She's, I mean, this is the most effusive dog because daddy came home. Now, if the doorbell rang and Peter was at the door, she would pretty much exhibit the same behavior with him. And so is is it that... I, I guess what I'm asking is, does she love me less because she seems to love him too? Or is it just that as a pack animal or a, a, and interacting with humans that she knows, well, this is someone who will take care of me. This is not anybody that's going to harm me. I'm going to go check this out. I, is she just excited? What what When you see a dog reacting similarly to a new person, th- th- should we read anything into that? Well, this is a Jason problem, not a Sandy problem. <laughs> All right, you know what? Now oh, even, suddenly my I, therapist wait, wait, just if like, I can love this guy yeah, <laughs> any, even more. He just, he just, he just <laughs> thought the game. Wow! Now I'm gonna owe this guy two hundred fifty bucks at the end of this. Episode. Thirty-five years I've known you, <laughs> and now I can start saying, <laughs> "I think it's a Jason." Yeah, this oh, is Jason. I problem. never thought to do that. That's one. <laughs> no, but what do you what do you mean by that? Seriously, I think secure. dogs are promiscuous. To be honest, uh-huh. go, I got you. I got you. Uh, I mean, dog, th- that's how they are. I mean, not obviously not all dogs are that way. Sure. Uh, and I can think of many examples who aren't. But, I mean, they're happy to be around people. And it, if it, it doesn't lessen, you know, her love for you. Right. But, you know, she likes someone else. Right. So what? Uh, as I said, they're promiscuous. Um, I mean, we can get into their reproductive habits and that will make even more sense. Yeah. Um but uh, and and I think I think actually all of these things are tied together. Their biology is is a certain way and it's different than ours. So the relationships that they form are going to be different. But I do think that in many cases they're unconditional. They're not. They're doing it because they enjoy it. Before you go, because the, the the books are fascinating, but you're really fascinating. I watched where where you've gone, not just to dogs, but during COVID that you moved. You uprooted your family. You moved remotely to a farm, which you'd never done before, which makes me laugh. It's like me on a farm going, what? What are we doing here? Which end is up? And you got these cows. And it really moved me in the sense because, oh, oh, jump. But anyway, these cows are affectionate. I saw the The cows know who you are. Once they got comfortable with you, the cows are lying there and you're scratching them. And we do a lot of shows here, and I usually try and find some subtext to the stories. Not just literally, do dogs love us, but how deep you go and what, what is there. So we had a guy on who has who works at an alligator farm in Florida. And he's got these alligators crawling all over him and petting him. And he says, they're not going to bite me. I've done this 20,000 times. Because once they know me and I'm not a food source, they trust me. And he's calling Darth Vader, playing the music. And the thing starts walking from over there to him. And they go in the water with the alligator. We did the story about the guy in Philadelphia who had a pet alligator for 15 years. Never bit him, whatever. And you go, if I got that wrong, this prehistoric-looking evil that I'm watching and the guy's it's, it's scratching, scratching its head, and I'm seeing cows lying with you, not saying that they've evolved the same way, it made me really sad in how we get stuff wrong with animals, how we judge and how we make a hierarchy of animals and decide how much they should suffer, how much they shouldn't suffer, yeah. how we should treat them as a food source or not a food source. So I'll let you address it, where you're at with that now, because apparently you love these cows, and they love you. If you see these videos, and you should, it'll blow your mind. They lie down and <laughs> present, present, so that you can scratch their belly. Was that a shock for you? It is, and, and, and thanks for that, because I want to give a plug for the book, which is coming out, so right there. Yeah. Cow Puppy. Cow Puppy, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Cow Puppy. Can't Dr. forget Gregory that. 
Um, it is a, it is a shock in some ways, uh, but now the more the more animals that I get to know, you you start to see that that there are commonalities. You know that that all animals have this capacity to pretty much get along with at least their own species and to varying degrees other species too. Um, the, the alligator surprises me a little bit, um, because I mean, you know, they're old, they're, they're really old, right, those yeah. animals. but they do, you know, but then again, they do live together, right? So they have some kind of social structure in some sense. They don't eat each other typically. Uh, and so then you realize it's like, wow, you I mean, all these animals out there have these very complicated social structures. And, and not only that, they have the capacity uh, I think built in for getting enjoyment and some kind of reward out of it because, you know, that's how evolution works. You know, it kind of links these things that are so important for survival to our reward systems. Right. And, and so, yeah, so I kind of fell into this world of farming. I got, got these little cows to help me manage pastures. And then I ended up falling in love with them because they have very dog-like traits, except it's, it's like, you know, take your, your most anxious kind of nervous dog and, you know, scale it up to be about 400 pounds. And then you've got a cow kind of, <laughs> uh, so it, it, it takes a little bit of work and they reciprocate in ways that it kind of makes you like, you have to take it down several notches just to be around them. They don't play like dogs in that way, but, but they, but their calmness kind of rubs off on you. And so, so that's what I'm, I'm, you know, trying to tell people and, uh, and does it make me think about kind of where my food comes from? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. And has it changed you dramatic? You know, I'm looking at you, like I said, in this wood panel den. You probably bought, bought more real estate than you had before because you more, moved more rural. I don't know if you fight more with the family because they said, we moved because of you because my family may make me pay for that unless everybody was all on board. But like you just said, it looks so serene and peaceful. It looks like it would change my RPM, and I'm pretty fast RPM. Like it forces you to breathe differently and disengage from stuff that I was engaging in and look at stuff differently. Did that happen? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it I mean, you, when you, when you're out there with animals, uh, you know, we have chickens and, you know, managing pastures. Um, it's not just the cows. It's you become hyper aware of the environment because you're right there. You know, everything that you're doing uh, is dependent on, you know, what's coming from nature. So yeah, I mean, the weather, uh, the sun, what the grass is doing, how much rain we have, uh, the bugs, everything. It's just, you're surrounded by it. Is it, is it always relaxing? No way. Yeah. You know, uh, <clears throat> it's, it, it's, it's extremely hard. Uh, and it gave me new, respect that I didn't even have for farmers and, and agriculture in general and just how difficult it is. What shock you before we go, what shock you the most about the cows, their behavior? Is there a, and have you gotten have you gotten a cow in an MRI yet? <laughs> no, I haven't that's probably not gonna happen. Yeah. Um uh the the thing that's probably most surprising to me is how demonstrative they are emotionally. Um you you wouldn't think so. But they do, they, you know, they come up and they, you know, I have them trained, they roll over, they want belly rubs, uh, they just want to be around. And, and unlike the dogs, I don't really feed them, at least not directly because they eat grass. So it's even more removed from kind right. of wow. you know, direct mm, hand association. feeding. Yeah. Uh, at the, they finally just decided that I'm part of their little community and, and accept me into it the alligator yeah. is probably similar yep. you know i i guess this is for just a a, a little discussion you think because i don't I, I this this is where my evolution of all these stories we've done peter with with you know dogs that are pushing buttons and the alligators and we've done a fair amount of stuff <clears throat> that all the bottom line is is that these animals are capable of a lot more interaction, a lot more communication, a lot more self-determination, a lot more emotionality <clears throat> than we give them credit for. And you're talking about, you know, I'm not surprised that cows can react like a puppy, but, you know, you were talking about the animals on your farm and I'm going, well, but certainly not a chicken. And then I'm sitting in there going, well, but why not a chicken? 
you know, why, why am I so quick to dismiss the notion that a chicken could be just as capable of some of this interaction um, as, a, as a dog or a cat? And it, it, where, where I'm left after all these conversations every time is going, I don't know <clears throat> how to move through this world. And a, f- the easy fix is, well, you're a vegan now. You're not going to use animals for your sustenance. But the, the, the innate abuse that we heap on other species as we make the world something that functions for us is endless. And it was, it was not that it's ever okay, but it was a little more okay when I thought, well, they don't well, have, and that's why they don't like get to be, it. You want to be they can't, you know, feel it. They can't. <clears throat> and this, it, this, you know, yeah, ignorance Oblivious was is bliss. Easier, is easier. And and are are you? Because um, forgive me, I have not read uh, the books. Are you? Do you move towards any sort of a <clears throat> sort of overarching philosophy about what our responsibility is, or what what we need to at least be considering as we continue to reshape this world <laughs> in the image we need to to, to accommodate yeah. all of this? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's an evolving philosophy to to be sure, um, but I'm not I'm not vegan. I'm not vegetarian. I don't promote those, mm-hmm. and uh, and there's a very pragmatic reason why. Um, very quickly, you realize when you're when you're out on a farm, even if you're just growing vegetables, fruit and vegetables, there's still there's still a tremendous toll on the other animals that you know get pushed out um, or get you know, exterminated for, you know, to make way for crops. There's no, there's no easy way out if you want to eat. Right. So I think then, I think that's kind of the, not the best way to think about it. I think you're on the right track and this is how I like to think about it is, okay, look, we, we want to live, we need to eat in this world. Uh, There's a lot of people that, that need to be fed. How can we do it in a way that, you know, essentially respects the animals whose lives that, that we depend on. Um, and I know some places do it better than, than we do. I think, I think in the U S it's, it's horrible, frankly, uh, you know, 95% of the beef comes from industrialized agriculture and that's just, you know, turning cows into widgets. Um, I've seen other farms where it doesn't have to be that way. Um, you can still eat beef if, and the cows live uh, a good life for as long as they have it and, and they don't suffer. Um, I, I would like to kind of move in that direction. And I think people are thinking about that. The problem, of course, is, as I'm sure you know, is it's expensive. You know, to, to raise food and animals that way costs money. And not everyone can pay that price. So... It's going to be slow. I think if consumers want it, then you know things will shift. It's, it's been mm-hmm. slow. Well, check out the new book, <gasps> Cow Puppy, An Unexpected Friendship and a Scientist's Journey into the Secret World of Cows. And you know, go online, and we got links on our site, too, um, if you're listening to this, just to see the cows frolic with you. And you, you say, what's love? Can you test love? Can you put them in an MRI? I think you don't have to. I think all you have to do is see this cow lying on your lap and you're seeing that cow's face and his behavior, and you get that that cow is in love with you. So ver- very cool. You know Thank what I get? What do I don't you, get, what do you get that. You don't get that? What do you no, mean? No, I get this cow's going, this guy's never cut in my throat. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> maybe, I'm, I'm maybe, licking his hand. I'm lying in his lap. Maybe oh, that. This guy's not coming that. after me. Well, I don't think he's doing I'm that. I'm not either. winding up on his plate. He'll go. He'll go for the little pig over there who's being an ass. And you know what the other cows are doing? The other cows are going. Push him out of the way and get me on his lap. Doctor, and the dog is going. I thought we had something special going here. Pointing. I understand. And I'm telling you, this is all. He's creating. It's cows now. Horrors. And you know what? They're adopting cows as pets now because they can be house trained. And a dog is. The dogs are not. I learning, will ready. beg you, please do that. I want to come to your house and have a baby cow. Well, you know what? The dog is going. I got to learn how to give milk and cheese now to compete. <laughs> really, really, <laughs> Doctor Burns, it's a joy. Want to hear you play? So, what kind of music do you play? What's the What's the genre? Well, since I moved to country, it's country. Is it really? Of course. Well, <laughs> sure. Right. There you go. All of a sudden, Kenny Chesney lives in Dr. Burns' house. That's right. Dr. Burns, yeah. thank you for Take being with us. Take my tractor sexy. There you yeah, go. Oh, exactly. look at that. Well, thank you very much. Check out the book, Cow Puppy, An Unexpected Friendship and Scientist's Journey 
into the secret world of cows. Thanks so much. You're wonderful. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Love it. Pleasure. Pleasure.